Hello everyone and welcome into our Network and Learn event that is here to kick off the 2022-2023 school year. As we enter this new year and enter a new approach to how we're going to conduct the Network and Learns this year, we wanted to go ahead and take a look back and recommend some of our favorite resources that have come out of these events in previous years. While we will be showing clips in our recommendations, links to the full network and learns can be found in the description of this video. So without further ado, let's pop in the tape, hit rewind, and look at some of our favorite picks. Hi, my name is Kelly Culp, and I'm a high school English teacher in Columbus, Indiana. And I wanted to introduce to you um, Andre Tisha Fitzgerald. Um, she has a great way of talking to us about big topics that sometimes can be intimidating. But today she shares with us some of her thoughts from what 2020 really meant to her. And one of the things that really sticks out to me is how each of us has something that we can do, even when things feel just so overwhelming, there is something that we can do. Um, the other thing that really her talk brings to light for me is that UDL is bigger than the basic curriculum that we sometimes just put it in a box as. Um, there's a lot more to it than just those basic curriculum lenses that we often view it in. And we really just need to open our eyes and um, take our actions a little bit further. Um, the other thing you might want to think about is reading her book, Anti-Racism and Universal Design for Learning, Building Expressways to Success. Hello, my name is Andra Tisha Fritzgerald, and I am the author of Anti-Racism and Universal Design for Learning, Building Expressways to Success. I'm going to share with you just a little bit about how 2020 changed me, and I have some notes on the side to support me as I share with you. The event that changed me most in 2020 was the murder of George Floyd. His murder and seeing the brutality, witnessing a life being taken away, released a flood for me. First, it released a flood of tears, a flood of emotion, and the most overwhelming emotion that I faced was the flood of grief. I grieved for what actually was happening and what had happened. I grieved for all of the past acts of brutality that connected with that moment. And I grieved over the possibility of what could be if we do nothing. And that grief, that grief led me to think about my own son and daughter, young in this world with black skin that could make them a victim just for existing. I thought about my husband who is a black man, tall, and maybe looked at as a threat if people don't know him and don't take the chance to understand him. I thought about the danger in this world simply for being Black. That grief, the reality of what could be struck me in ways that I cannot describe. And I spent the Saturday after his murder weeping and weeping. And then I would go to my timeline and take a look. And what I saw, what I saw were the students who used to be in my classroom leading protests in DC, participating in protests in Atlanta and in various places all over. They were given advice on what to take to the rallies if you were going. And I sat with my grief and my tears and I saw that each of us has a role each of us has something that we can do to make the protest personal. And so because brutality cannot continue, I made a choice to remain in my grief, to organize my thoughts and to figure out a principled approach to address the inequity, to address what was so brutal. And in that I finished writing anti-racism and universal design for learning because this is a framework that my heart and soul believes sees and values 
black and brown learners and teaches and equips teachers with what they need to see beyond what society says, beyond just the color of skin, beyond the expectations that sometimes limit what black and brown children can accomplish and pushes every child toward the greatness that they were born with on the inside. And so through the tears, I saw students who had grown up to address the brutality that was best for them. I saw teachers encouraging one another through this twin pandemic of both racism and coronavirus. And I saw hope. I wanted to be a part of the hope, to be a part of the change. So I used my words as a personalized protest to change the story for those who sit in front of classrooms that I will never enter. And so today, I pray that my story inserts hope into your story that will insert hope into the story of another. I'm so stirred by what has taken place in 2020, but I am forever changed to take my grief, to take the tragedy and find ways to force it into triumph. And I will hope that you do the same. 2020 has taught us so many lessons, but from these lessons, we must make the decision to teach. Thank you. I can't wait for you to hear what Jennifer Pusteri has to say. She has a lot to tell us about the reality of barriers and how we can use flexibility to enhance relationships instead of breaking them down. The other thing that I think is really poignant is um, the executive function loss and the ramifications of that loss. We've seen it throughout um, the pandemic and we continue to see that reaching into today. And I think it's just a great reminder to us that um, it's still something we need to figure out um, how to best approach within our daily lives. Um, you can also check out her new book. It's Transforming, Transform Your Teaching with UDL, Six Steps to Jumpstart Your Practice. Hi, my name is Jennifer Pusateri. I'm the Universal Design Consultant with the Center for the Enhancement of Learning and Teaching on the campus of the University of Kentucky. And um, I, I'm also a, a CAS national faculty member, and um, I'm a former uh, K-12 teacher, and um, currently I work with faculty at the, um, at the University of Kentucky where um, I help them to infuse their coursework with um, universal design for learning principles. So one of the things I think that's been really interesting to watch um, develop over the course of this pandemic has been faculty, um, faculty members' attitudes towards student learning barriers. And I think what has happened is that when students were face-to-face -face with them in the classroom, they, um, they didn't really see some of the barriers that our students were actually encountering. And so now that students are all um, working from home, um, or at least during the spring, they all were, uh, now some are, and some are on campus, but um, having people working from their homes is um, giving faculty a, a way to sort of see into the background of, of their lives. And so um, a lot of times students will uh, approach faculty and let them know things like, you know, I, my internet is really shoddy because I live in, um, in a very rural location that just, just doesn't have solid internet. Um, other students might be um, having to say that I can't attend this uh, class time that you've got scheduled at 10 a.m. on a Thursday uh, because my, my I'm, I'm watching my younger siblings while my parents are working and during that time they are on online for for school and we only have one device at home so we all have to share that and so I think uh, this has happened a lot um, and and it's been really interesting to see how faculty have reacted to that I think a lot of them honestly didn't really know that these learning barriers were in place for our students. Um, and although, you know, I don't think any educator would wish uh, COVID on anyone, but I think one of the things that we can take away from this is faculty will be more aware of uh, the learning barriers that occur for our students. And I think they um, are much more willing to, um, to be flexible in, in their schedules and assignments, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And so I, I look forward to seeing how this plays out, um, hopefully as we go back to, um, 
mostly in face-to-face -face learning over the next semester or two um, and to see how that how that looks when when we're face to face with our students but now aware um, of all of these learning barriers that in fact occur um, one other thing i think has been really interesting is to see um, not only students but also instructors reacting to this sort of um, loss of executive function that a lot of people have had. Um, you know, we, we know from research that um, stress and trauma reduces our capacity for executive function. So things like um, organization, time management, um, regulating our emotions, those things become much more difficult when we're under stress um, and trauma. And of course, a lot of us are, are under stress and trauma. Uh, in fact, some psychologists have have called this pandemic um, a collective trauma. So we're kind of all in that place right now where um, we, you know, we're disorganized and frazzled and we really don't know why. And, and um, you know, those of us who are familiar with universal design for learning can kind of point, pinpoint that and be like, oh, okay, well, it's, it's our executive functions that are really suffering. Um, and so I, it's been interesting to see how students have reacted to that, but it's also been interesting to see how faculty have reacted um, to not only the executive functioning struggles of their students, but also of themselves. Um, they come into our vir virtual office hours at times, and they're like, "I, I don't, I don't know why I can't do this. Like, this is a thing I should be able to do." Or, when they're really frustrated with, um, with sort of their, the way that their, um, their minds are processing things right now. And, and um, I think a lot of people are in that place. So it will be interesting going forward to see how these uh, effects from this pandemic will play out um, as we kind of head back toward normalcy in education. Thank you and have a good one. Um, time is always a, a constraint. It, you know, there, there wasn't enough time before um, this pandemic. So, um, you know, really finding the time to, to create the resources to accommodate all learners. Um, obviously a unique situation. So we're, we're trying to find the tools that are, are going to help to cut the, the workload of, of teachers. Um, and also from the, the student standpoint, um, we're searching for, for technology that's going to you know, lower those barriers for students and allow them you know, to have the, the most robust uh, education experience they can under these circumstances. And then I, I would say the biggest constraint is, is probably um, you know, building relationships and being able to offer um, you know, genuine feedback to our, our students. It's, it's very difficult to establish two-way contact with, with a lot of our students. Um, so you know, it, it, it takes a little bit longer in this atmosphere. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lag when you're, when you're emailing students and, and checking in on them and, and calling them and, and not, not getting a response. So, you know, all of these little things that we took for granted when we can just quickly check in with a, a child that's in front of us um, and have those, you know, informal conversations just to see how things are going. Everything takes a little bit longer. So, um, you know, one thing that I, I started to do is, is what, what I'm calling feedback Fridays and, and, and just, you know, having students kind of take a survey. How did your week go? Grade yourself. You know, what are your reflections? Grade. I, I want them to grade me on how my lessons were. And, 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 and I seem to be finding some success there. Um, just making, again, making those points of contact, which are, are so, so difficult now with, with a good portion of our students. It's, it's definitely a challenge. You come face to face with your friends and actually being able to see your teacher and do just do work with your teacher and have fun with your friends and you find your time. It's just become really easy at school. I mean, it's easy here, but I think I have more fun at school in face for me <laughs> yeah no I, I i agree there's you know it's it's interesting there's a lot of students looking forward to getting back to school because uh, working with 
their friends is is usually um, it could be easier for some many students to, who like to collaborate and work with friends, and you know, and at the same time, um, going back to school right now could be very uh, frightening experience for some students. Um, um, it, it's interesting. We're, we're there's a lot of different perspectives. Um, there's another data point on the survey that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, in this question, we're going to ask uh, Jeremy, we're going to ask you and, and, and your mom, Liz, as a, as a teacher, and Neil as a parent uh, on this question. Um, but going back to the data we heard about, on average, about half of students rated the relationships with teachers and adults in school positively. But only one in three rated their sense of belonging positively. And as, as Dr. Matt had shared, that's, that's kind of a concerning number. Only one out of three students rated their sense of belonging positively. Jeremy, let me ask you this question. Uh, what does a positive relationship or a good relationship with a teacher look like to you? How would you describe what a, what a good relationship with a teacher? A good relationship with a teacher is what I see is that the teacher makes it make sense and makes it look easy. And when we do it, she tells us what to do and helps us with our struggles and encourages us to do what work she gives us. That sounds like a, that sounds like a really uh, great answer and a great relationship between a teacher and student. Malik, um, I, I know I'm going to ask you an, uh, a, a, a couple other questions, but would you mind weighing in on this one? Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, I love to hear the student's voice. Um, Malik, what, how would you, as a ninth grader, uh, how would you define what a positive relationship with a teacher, what, what does that look like to you? Hold on, I had my phone muted, I'm sorry. Can you repeat it back question? to him? Sure, Malik, we, we're curious on, from your perspective, what does a good relationship with a teacher look like or sound like? Um. I feel like the good communication with a teacher should be like where like like you're comfortable to go talk to the teacher about stuff that like you need help with or comfortable to go talk to the teacher about stuff like about anything really. So and somebody like, who's approachable. Yeah, somebody who's approachable. Somebody you, you can trust to share something with and feel yeah. and feel okay. All right, thank you based on what's best for the children, not, not the way somebody feels or how they think it should be going back to what Christina was talking about. You know, if it's, if it's not the way you think it should be, I just hope that decisions are being made by people that are in charge of making the decisions that, that very best benefit Malik, that very best benefit Jeremy, that very best benefit my kids and, and their development and, you know, their scholastic careers and, Look, man, I mean, the the, the bricks and the foundation uh, for their entire lives are being built right now. And and I just hope that the, the people that make these decisions, I mean, these are huge, huge decisions. I hope the people that make these decisions, they, they really have that at the bottom of their heart with, with what they're doing. Because, uh, again, going back to it, this is what's going to shape their lives. There's no bigger statement in the world than that. I mean, in... I just, I just hope that everybody that, that is a, you know, you talked about stakeholders, everyone that's a stakeholder in the decision-making process, please understand that if you're watching this now, if you're watching this later, if you're going back to watch it, understand that this, this is going to determine the path of people's lives, these decisions you make and, and the situations you set up. So treat it accordingly. I'm Matt Love from the Professional Learning Committee, and the pick I made was our UDL patio talk from August 2020. Um, as we were preparing to enter the 2020 school year, uh, we brought together a panel that I think highlighted really great ideas for how we moved on from our crisis reaction to the transition in the pandemic into creative solutions. Because even as we return to a, a semblance of normal, I want us to continue thinking about new possibilities in the classroom. So I hope you enjoy the preview and I encourage you to watch the full network and learn from that night. So it's great to see everybody tonight. This is our um, uh, 
first post pandemic, I guess, or pre pandemic or during pandemic network and learn where we're delighted to have everybody joining us this this evening. Um, we're doing our very first UDL patio talk. I was just talking to our guests. So we've been invited to speak tonight um, and to share with you that our patio talk is something new for us. We're really looking to turn this into an evening of conversation. Um, so instead of panelists, we've called our invited uh, friends, guests. Uh, and so just like a guest at your patio at your patio party, we'll just be having conversations. We'll seed it with some questions that we've come up with but, and questions that you come up with. But really, we're hoping to turn this into an organic conversation. Um, and we're relying on you as participants to be involved in this. So hop on the chat. That's how we'll uh, communicate tonight, uh, ask questions, share ideas. We'll talk more about uh, that process uh, as I dive a little deeper into it. But our topic tonight is really this idea of moving from crisis to creativity. So we've all been um, uh, struggling with, as soon as the uh, pandemic hit and we had to close down schools and figure out how to do this remote instruction in sort of a, a panic way from this crisis perspective. And now that we recognize we're probably going to be in some sort of remote hybrid uh, learning model that we're, we, we now need to move from this crisis response to really thinking intentionally and designing using our designer and creative brain. And so we wanted that to be the focus of our conversation tonight. How can we really think about the UDL framework and the intentionality of that and move from this place of uh, a reaction to, to a place of really proaction and design? Uh, yeah, so thanks, Sue. Um, there's no pressure in introducing uh, tonight's guests. Um, they are like, uh, they're, they're a who's who. Um, what, I, what I really love is the title slide where it says, um, you know, uh, overcoming and, and, and using creativity. And every one of these folks I have had the pleasure of either working with, talking with, um, or, or just hearing their words of wisdom. And each one of them comes with a creative solution to any problem. And the panel that has been put together is just a really diverse perspective lens. So, um, you know, just starting out, there's there's uh, Dr. J. Marks, um, who I used to work with over at. And yeah, I, I do hear a lot of you know the start of these threads, right? About really thinking about this um, while while it's been um, a real challenge for everybody, the pandemic, there might be some silver linings to the way that we think about education and the way we design for everybody for these inclusive and equitable practices. So um, I appreciate that. That I think that's gonna be a, a large part of our conversation this evening. Brian, did you wanna weigh in? Uh, yeah, I just, I, I always love to hear your perspective, Tanya, because, it, because not only do you have like this global view and this district size view, but you also have a view that's, that's very much in your classroom. Um, and what I love is that this is like, like the sense of hope that you bring to this conversation, like to that, to that idea of like, we're going to really start to take a look at the things that have always been systemic barriers. And now we have a new opportunity. And I think that, um, that, I think that that's, that's the voice, that's the positive voice that we need to hear from, you know, like to start building up a groundswell with our educators, right? Because there is a lot of things that are unknown in our world, right? Especially in education and how that's going to work and how are we going to deliver and how are we going to build community and how are we going to, you know, how are we going to kind of, fig, you know, figure out digital divides and, and gaps. But, but the idea that this is this unique opportunity for us to really examine some of the old barriers and find out that the solution isn't this or that. Right. It's not it's not in person, face to face learning and it's not just remote learning. Right. But it's somewhere it can be somewhere in between. And like once we free up that possibility, like that's the creative side. Once we free up that possibility, what does it really mean? Right. Like it means it means evening classes for some kids. It means morning classes for some kids. It could mean just a potential and that can be overwhelming. But the positivity of it, I think, is, is really, really brilliant. Thank you for joining us on our Network and Learn Rewind. We hope you'll take the time to dig into some of the full videos that we've recommended. And we'd like to invite you on our 2022-2023 shift in focus as we move away, at least temporarily, from the network and learn style events and move into more of an opportunity to network and connect this year.